is Mr. Rin Berry. And Mr. Rin Berry is the historical advisor to the NAVS, that is the North American Vegetarian Society. And he has been featured as a featured speaker for five international vegan and vegetarian world congresses. He has been specialized in the study of vegetarianism from a historical perspective. And he was commissioned to write the entry on the history of vegetarianism, uh, excuse me, vegetarianism in America for the Oxford Encyclopedia of American Food and Drink, that is in 2005. And he's written in the Fletcherism, Raw Foodism, Veganism, uh, veganism excuse me, The Influence of Animal Rights on Western Diet and Vegetarianism, and the North American Vegetarian Society for the Oxford Companion to Food and Drink in America, that is in 2007. And Mr. Rin is the author of six major books. His books have been translated into Nepalese, German, Italian, Taiwanese, Chinese, Polish, Bulgarian, Hungarian, and inter excuse me, Alliance. And Mr. Rin is also the author of six vegan animal rights themed plays, Tea with, uh, excuse me, Tolos Thai, and forgive my pronunciation. Uh, Paitha Abaris, excuse me, thank you, and Theano, the Mona Lisa Smile, the Smiling Savior, and the Buddha's Last Summer that have been performed all over the U.S. and will soon be published in book form. So if you could all join me in welcoming Mr. Rin, please. <laughs> Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. I hope I can live up to the billing. <laughs> uh, and thanks. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is uh, in the nature of an historical uh, survey of the vegetarian groups that have changed the world. And the most striking thing about them is that they all have a religious component. And... Uh, it's, uh, it's been widely held that vegetarianism is a secular movement, but actually it does have its uh, roots in uh, uh, religion, and uh, really beginning with the religion of uh, India, the, uh, the so-called ahimsa-based religions. And when I say ahimsa, I guess you all know what that means, right? Is, is anyone, can anyone give me a... Thumbnail uh, definition or to do, yeah, none, yes. Well, means to do harm, so ahimsa negates that means non-violence, Yeah, non-harming to all, all living creatures. And uh, in Jainism, which is considered to be the Ur religion, uh, the shamanic religion, the indigenous religion of India, uh, it uh, extends to all living beings, including... Uh, Insects, the lowly, what we consider in the West to be the lowliest creatures, actually have uh, a right to live. And Jain priests and uh, devout Jains uh, avoid treading on them. They go out of their way. They will, the priests won't travel during the rainy season for fear of uh, treading on bugs. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll try to project more. Um, so uh, Jain Jainism and Buddhism, which in my book, uh, Food for the Gods, I analyze as a Jainism for the export market. Uh, in other words, it's a, a Jainism that uh, is made palatable to the world because it's uh, stripped of its rather fussy uh, uh, requirements. You know, Jains, for example, can't eat after dark because uh, for fear of inhaling insects. Uh, they have to filter their water for fear of uh, ingesting them. So, so Buddhism didn't wasn't quite as uh, rigorous as uh, Jainism in uh, its uh, strictures. But uh, so, uh, characteristic of Jainism and Buddhism is that they have uh, a first precept, uh, in other words, which overrides all the others. They, they have a sort of decalogue in Jainism, <laughs> as we do in our, uh, in our uh, Abrahamic traditions in the West. 
but the uh, Decalogue is such that the first commandment uh, takes precedence over all the others. Uh, the phrase is uh, Ahimsa Paramo Dharma. Ahimsa is the paramount teaching. And uh, you're actually allowed to violate all the other commandments in the service of Ahimsa. So if you, uh, you can break the commandment on stealing or on lying in order to save the life of another being. Uh, yeah. So, I, uh, and as I said, compared to our Decalogue in the West, uh, the injunction against killing is the first. It's the first, whereas in the West, what is it? The injunction against killing? Yeah. And where does it rank? Do you know? Sixth. Yeah, sixth. And the first is what? In the West? Yeah, that's right. So uh, it's a little far down on the list of thou shalt nots. It's uh, not. <laughs> and it doesn't extend to all living creatures. It's really, it refers to members of your, your group or your tribe. So well, there's a, quite a, uh, a sharp uh, distinction between East and re West in that respect. So that may account for the fact that we tend to venerate other beings so somewhat less that are dramatically less than, than uh, in the Ahimsa-based uh, religions of the West, of the East, I should say. So in other words, if uh, it's the, uh, in uh, Buddhism, uh, the, the teaching is that you're, let's say you're walking through the forest and a hunter uh, runs through the forest in hot pursuit of a deer and uh, he, he loses the deer's uh, trail and he asks you as a bystander which way the deer ran, you're allowed to uh, break the commandment on uh, truth-telling, right? Uh, satya, and, and say, uh, well, he ran in the opposite direction. <laughs> or when he's not looking, you can break the commandment against uh, stealing, you know, stay uh, and steal his bow and arrows. Or, you know, if you're desperate to... Uh, Distract him, you can even uh, you know, seduce him, him or her, regardless of... <laughs> break the commandment on, uh, on chastity. So, so that's how it, essentially how it works. <laughs> As we're really desperate. <laughs> so uh, the Ahimsa-based religions were really the first to... Uh, <clears throat> to arise during the axial age, what call it, Iaspers. Yes? I'm sorry, you're in the old but just going along those lines. Yes. If this hunter was going to kill, say, you know, 30 humans, would it be okay to kill him? You know what I'm saying? Like, give him the greater good? Well, no, because then you're violating the, the paramount teaching, which is... So you can never do that, even though you're going to prevent someone else from killing more people. Well, you, you know, you have all the other... Uh, uh, commandments to in your arsenal. Uh, to <laughs> why resort to the uh, the ultimate? Uh, you know, mur killing another creature. So that's stri strictly forbidden. And uh, in fact, uh, in India, Jains are uh, don't won't serve in the military. There are no Jain generals in the Indian army because they consider that to be uh, abhorrent. You know, that's. So they're pacifists. From, the, uh, the strict Jains are pacifists from birth. So murder in the service of saving life is, is strictly prohibited. Uh, now, uh, Buddhism, uh, in addition to having... Uh, Buddhism, as I said, is a popularization of Jainism and has spread throughout at, at its high watermark it spread throughout Asia and has actually established itself uh, in the West. Very, you know, within the past uh, century, uh, Buddhism has made uh, tremendous inroads. It's one of the fastest growing religious movements in the West. And uh, so it has uh, moved westward. But uh, in fact, many uh, scholars have analyzed another. Uh, quasi-religious group 
as being uh, a Western manifestation of Buddhism. Uh, does anyone know what that might have been? That, that, that group, that quasi-religious group? Pardon? Uh, well, you're partially correct. But a little farther west than the Near East. What? Well, they were transcendental, but uh, much, much earlier. Right? Vegans. Well, they were vegans as well, but do you, know, you know the name of the group? Pythagorean. That's right. Pythagorean. The Pythagoreans in, in ancient Greece were considered to be the, the earliest uh, historical group that uh, protested uh, the eating of animals uh, in the West. In fact, as you, I'm sure you know, the term Pythagorean was the ter- actually the term of art for uh, what we would call uh, veganism today until the uh, middle of the 19th century. And pe- people who followed a fleshless diet were referred to as Pythagoreans on the West. Uh, for example, the great poet uh, Percy Shelley, when he became a vegetarian, uh, after being uh, uh, sent, uh, sent uh, cashiered, you know, fired, from, expelled from Oxford, he, he uh, eloped with his girlfriend, and he wrote to his uh, family members that he, he and his uh, bride had adopted the Pythagorean system, and it agrees uh, with us. That's a direct quote from one of his letters. So he, uh, it was a synonym for what we meant what we mean today by vegan. Uh, there was no dairying in, in ancient Greece uh, because it was <clears throat> there were prohibitions against exploiting animals. And in order to join the Pythagorean society, a condition of membership was to take uh, a vow of uh, non-flesh eating or non-flesh consuming. In antiquity, of course, yes. No, it was it was a popular group, uh, very popular, in fact. I mean, but it was very exclusive in its membership. In other words, you had to be very brainy and very uh, athletically uh, gifted to uh, to be a, become a Pythagorean, and you had to take the, the vegetarian vow to join. It was a condition of membership. Uh, and they have a, the first precept, obviously, and like like the Jains and the uh, the Buddhists, they uh, waged uh, protest against the sacrifice of animals. Uh, during the Axial Age, these religious uh, state religions uh, uh, adopted the bizarre practice of uh, uh, slaughtering animals and uh, cooking their their flesh. Uh, as part of religious ceremonies and throughout the, throughout the world, the worldwide phenomenon. Uh, so in ancient I- India, we had the the uh, the Indo-European invasions and the Vedic texts, which are really manuals of animal sacrifice. So the Buddha and Mahavira, uh, the historical founder of Jainism, rose up to protest animal sacrifice, and um, they were considered her- heretical. They were heresies. Buddhism was a heresy. Jainism was a, you know, considered to be heretical. But uh, they were successful in that they succeeded in reforming uh, Vedic Hinduism. And as a result of their efforts, the, uh, the priests, the so-called the Brahmins, were, became uh, strict uh, vegans, vegetarians, at that time. And even today, Brahmins are... Uh, the twice-born castes are, uh, are uh, vegeta- conscientious vegetarians. Of course, that, owing to westernization, that has uh, somewhat fallen off. But still, p- predominantly, uh, the twice-born castes are, are vegetarian, even today. And this is a result of the Jain and Buddhist reforms. And their teachings mi- migrated westward uh, Pythagoras is believed to have traveled to India, perhaps sitting, sitting at the feet of Mahavira or, or the Buddha himself. And 
in, in ingesting these ideas of uh, nonviolence and uh, even his mathematical uh, uh, discoveries have actually been attributed to uh, some, some of the Jain mathematicians of the period. It is n known, it is recorded that he traveled uh, as far as India and that's probably where he got his, uh, his ideas of uh, uh, Ahimsa-based uh, 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 culture. And uh, another notable feature of Pythagoreanism, characteristic of the Ahimsa-based religions, is that they have a doctrine of uh, samsara in uh, Pythagoreanism, what they call metempsychosis in Greek. Uh, does anyone know what that is? Reincarnation. That's right, reincarnation. And that's, uh, uh, reincarnation is uh, an identifying characteristic of uh, religions that uh, espouse a vegetarian diet. Uh, and why should that be? Why would that be? Does anyone know? Karma, Karma that's right. It's related to that. That's right. And also there's the potential that, that you might be uh, uh, swallowing uh, you know, parts of a, your grandmother or, or some uh, departed, uh, some dear departed uh, relative, uh, Aunt Agatha or something. So uh, that's why uh, reincarnation acts uh, as a break on, on carnivorous impulses. Uh, so uh, all of these... Uh, we call these uh, groups that I've mentioned have a sort of reincarnative uh, approach to, uh, to life. And as I mentioned earlier, scholars um, have analyzed Pythagoreanism as a Western manifestation of Buddhism. Why was Pythagoras so well known in the ancient world? Why did he influence so many people, such as uh, Plato, for example? Moses Hadas, the great uh, scholar at Columbia, said that the largest precipitate of Pythagoreanism is to be found in Plato. Because uh, one reason why he was so well known in the ancient world and why his name became a uh, synonym for uh, uh, nonviolent eating is that he was uh, a successful athletic coach. <laughs> Very few people uh, realize that today. It sounds... Uh, like an oxymoron, but in fact, uh, he trained uh, the greatest athlete uh, who ever lived, uh, certainly at that time, and I guess he's forgotten today. But uh, does anyone know who that might have been in antiquity? His greatest... Uh, pardon? No, no, he's a, kind of a mythical... <coughs> pardon? That's right. He, he was a competitor in uh, the Oli early Olympics, and he, uh, wa he was a victor in eight successive Olympiads. He was an old man by the time he uh, retired, and uh, yet he was never, they say he was never even brought to his knees in his particular sport. Never once, never lost a match. Does anyone know? What? No, no, he wasn't a boxer. He was a, no, he was a wrestler. Yeah. His name was Milo of Croton. Milo of Croton. <laughs> so he was on the Wheaties box of the, of the period. <laughs> you know. And, uh, of course, all the coaches throughout the world, all the athletes wanted to emulate Milo of Croton. And uh, one reason, supposedly, why he was undefeated and so successful is that he followed the Pythagorean regimen and a Pythagorean diet. And uh, that was consisted, uh, according to Diogenes of La Diogenes La Laertius, Pythagoras' biographer, uh, his followers subsisted on a... Uh, uh, a uh, essentially... Uh, a uh, raw food diet, Roma ap apura. That means apura means unfired fruits and vegetables. So he was an early raw foodist, <laughs> vegan raw foodist. Milo of Croton, 
and Milo of Croton, yeah. And not, not, he was not a, the only uh, uh, athletic uh, champion trained by Pythagoras. There were many others. And uh, at the end of the, the, end of the match, uh, when, they, when they were on the victor's stand, uh, they would dedicate a, uh, uh, an animal you know, made of, usually of uh, dough, to the, to the god uh, of Zeus, who presided over the Olympics. Instead, the other athletes would dedic- actually sacrifice animals, which Pythagore- the Pythagorean champions sacrificed uh, animals made of uh, flour to, <laughs> to Zeus. Yeah. Well, it's not clear. As to, uh, you know, there are many theories. Uh, A.J. Eyre, the political philosopher, uh, uh, hypothesized that it was because uh, in antiquity people uh, cast instead of casting vo- votes or paper votes, they they they, ca- they cast beans for their political uh, favorites. In, in the in elections, people uh, would vote with beans. Uh, the, hence the original bean counters. You know, the, the uh, so in other words, it was it was a uh, an admonition to stay away from politics, to stay out of politics, avoid beans. <laughs> That's A.J. Ayer's uh, interpretation. It's a little convoluted, but the other, <laughs> the other, another uh, perhaps more uh, uh, more uh, sounder, more cogent region is that uh, beans are. Uh, uh, contain uh, trypsin inhibitors and are, are rather dangerous to consume in their raw state. So since they were predominantly uh, raw foodists, uh, that made, made eminent sense to avoid eating beans because only the, the smaller beans, like mung beans and uh, lentils, can be consumed uh, without cooking them. So f- perhaps that was just a pragmatic reason for abstaining rather than following A.J. Ayer's hypothesis of staying out of politics. Uh, because actually they were quite political, uh, and they tried to get Pythagorean uh, candidates elected. Pythagoras was very competitive, obviously, in training his athletes. So that's one reason why he was, he was so famous, and his name became synonymous with nonviolent eating. Uh, as I said, a Western uh, manifestation of Buddhism or Jainism, uh, and uh, continue to influence, and even today, Pythagoreanism is influential, if for no other reason than uh, the great Pythagorean theorem, which I'm sure you all remember, but in actual fact, it was the, the term for veganism until the word vegetarian was coined in, does anyone know? Roughly 1847, and then the word vegan recently coined in uh, when? 44, yes, that's right, by Donald Watson. And, uh, you know, people forget that Donald Watson's wife was, uh, helped him to uh, come up with the term. She's, she's not really given her due, but it was a joint effort and his wife, Dorothy, is usually omitted from these accounts <laughs> because they were, play, play, they were bandying ideas back and forth, playing, you know, and uh, they both, it was a joint effort. So, you know, it's, they do her an injustice by leaving her out. It was Donald and Dorothy Watson. <laughs> so feminists should certainly take note that it was Dorothy as well. So, yeah, but, that, but was, is veganism, uh, did veganism start in uh, 1944? No. Well, as we know from Pythagoras and Mahavira, you know, it was prevalent throughout the world because animal products were really very uh, costly and uh, prohibitively expensive in antiquity and consumed uh, rarely, on, mainly on ritual occasions in these temple ceremonies uh, so, uh, and that's why Pythagoras, for example, would go to the temple of Apollo at Delos 
with his <coughs> followers and uh, w- uh, performed counter sacrifices, and uh, and they would offer uh, fruits and vegetables to the god instead of uh, animals, instead of immolating animals on the altar and partaking of their flesh, they would uh, offer fruits and vegetables to show how a sacrifices should properly be performed bloodlessly and with the fruits of the harvest. So any questions about the, uh, these uh, original groups? And as I mentioned, they all have this religious component. Uh, about the 6th century, he flourished in the 6th century. Uh, AD. AD, uh, no, uh, BCE. Yeah. Um, Is there any recorded history of when man's first started to eat meat? Uh, no, I, I, there's no. Uh, but I, my own uh, opinion is that it's, uh, it's more recent than people think. I mean, it wasn't, I think the original diet was, was a vegan diet. And uh, that this uh, eating eating animals is a fairly uh, relatively recent phenomenon. So the, uh, the ancient Vedic Hindus were ritualistic eaters and told the Buddhists and the Chinese. Yeah, before. that's right. Yeah, and the Vedic texts are uh, manuals of sacrifice if you r- read them carefully. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to see if I understand you right. As far as the larger Greek culture, yeah. it's like they didn't eat very much meat either. That's right. So. That might explain, explain the strength they had. I, I know Homer said that the people of Troy's time were three times stronger than the people yeah. of, of Homer's time. Sure. Yeah, I, I believe they were, uh, you know, uh, very uh, well endowed with, with strength and f- f- make us look rather puny today, you know, because they were living, uh, you know, without uh, modern conveniences and uh, flesh was seldom consumed. Of course, the Homeric heroes are... Uh, you know, gorgers of animal flesh, unfortunately. But again, they confined it to ritual occasions, and they, that wasn't their daily fare. So. Pythagoras was contemporaneous with Milo and trained him personally? Yeah, that's right. He was one of the, in addition to being the great f- philosopher that he, that he was, he, uh, he was a, um, an athletic coach. I mean, it was, it's not incompatible. Uh, as you know, we have today. Everything is divided into jocks and non-jocks at universities. <laughs> but in, <laughs> at that time, Pythagoras believed in developing uh, spiritually and physically uh, at the same time. Uh, remember, Plato uh, is uh, his name. Does anyone know how he got his name? Plato. Well, Pla- uh, Plato is derived from Platus which means broad. So he was the broad-shouldered guy. He was a, a wrestler himself. So, yeah, he was a champion wrestler, an athlete. So, you know, it wasn't considered to be incompatible. Socrates was a great war hero. You know, he, he distinguished himself in battle, uh, saved the lives of Alcibiades and others. You know. uh, he had enormous endurance and strength. Socrates. Well, these guys are all very muscular, you know, and uh, we, they're not like uh, modern academics. <laughs> they, they were uh, rippling with muscles. And <laughs> I mean, the, the, these great... Uh, and so they... Uh, and they, let's, forget, they, let's not forget they were vegans, uh, probably all raw, raw foodists. A lot of their food was consumed raw. So what we're doing is reviving the uh, the, the regimen of, of antiquity, Re- rediscovering the original diet uh, that humans followed very successfully. <clears throat> so let's uh, move on to uh, the Essenes or the uh, the next group, the uh, the group to which Jesus is believed to have belonged, the Ebionites. Uh, they too have been analyzed as a Western manifestation of uh, the Ahimsa-based uh, culture. They were also anti-sacrificial, the, the Ebionites. And uh, Jesus himself uh, 
I remember he, he was brought up on charges for uh, going into the temple and uh, liberating the animals and saying, do not uh, desecrate my father's house. Uh, do not turn it into a meat market. So he was uh, very uh, true to, this, to these, these uh, ideals and precepts enunciated in uh, Jainism and Buddhism. The Ebionites, you know, the, they were a branch of the Essenes. Uh, uh, call it, they, they were the poor ones. They lived a, a very humble life, a lifestyle. They were anti-sacrificial. <coughs> they believed that the temple had been uh, corrupted by uh, the uh, the priests who were trafficking in uh, animals. How are they related to the Jews? They are Jew. They were they were Jew, uh, Jewish Jewish. Uh, uh, Josephus uh, describes them as uh, Pythag Jewish Pythagoreans. So, <laughs> or you could Jewish Buddhists. He didn't say Jewish Buddhists. He said he did say Jewish Pythagoreans. Uh, and the Gnostics, another uh, religious group that sprang up uh, in uh, in antiquity during the Axial Age were also sort of a heresy, you know. As I mentioned, these groups are heretical. They are reform groups. Uh, and uh, they were very successful in Asia. I mean, uh, they, obviously the Buddha and, and Mahavir were successful in reforming Vedic Hinduism. Uh, but uh, it's questionable as to whether Pythagoras was successful in uh, reforming uh, the Greek, Greek state, state religion. Uh, we'd have to call that a uh, a tie, I guess. <laughs> Let's say uh, Pythagoreanism uh, was was successful in its own right, but it was not. They did not abolish. They were not successful in abolishing animal sacrifice in uh, the Greek state religion. Was Jesus successful in reforming uh, Judaism? No, he wasn't. He paid for it with his life. Did Christianity go, go on to become a, a vegan uh, sect? <laughs> on the contrary. <laughs> it perverted his teachings and his, the record of his life as a, an anti-sacrificial religious reformer are completely uh, uh, forgotten but, you know, and suppressed. But they can be recovered. And the Gnostics are another uh, uh, <clears throat> group that uh, reform religious uh, group of religious reformers that uh, characteristically had this <clears throat> had a doctrine of reincarnation, and uh, the Gnostics taught that uh, we live in a in a fallen world uh, that uh, material things are. Uh, are uh, are damned, you know that uh, the material world is uh, <clears throat> degenerate, and that if we partake of material things, we uh, we ourselves will be uh, lost. <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the the whole impulse to become vegan in, in Gnosticism derives from the the idea that we descend, we all descend from. Uh, the, the pleroma, which is a source of light, and that eventually that each of us contains a spark of the pleroma, and that we have, ultimately we uh, we seek to return to the source of light upon our death. And the worst thing we can possibly do is to eat animal flesh because animal flesh is uh, dead dead flesh. It's uh, carrion. It's uh, dense and heavy and material and weighs us down uh, and pre preventing us from uh, evolving and uh, becoming uh, and uniting, reuniting with the pleroma. But do the animals Yes, they do, yes. Mm -hmm. All creatures have, have this spark of divinity. But if we kill animals and eat their dead flesh, sure. then we, uh, we're weighed down by this... Uh, dense uh, 
weight of materialism, which is charged with uh, with uh, damnation. Yes. Yeah. You might be thinking of the Essene Gospel of Peace. Yeah. Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, it's a beautiful uh, re- uh, religious uh, tract, but it was uh, it was written by a uh, Ed- Edmund Bordeaux Zekle, a uh, Hungarian uh, uh, author, who uh, claimed to have discovered it in the Vatican. But it's been but uh, patristic scholars have dismissed it as a hoax, unfortunately. So yeah. But it's a, you know certainly it urges a vegan diet and a raw food diet at that, but uh, it's not a genuine gospel of any kind. Or you know. there have been a lot of forgeries that you know, pretend to be original gospels or lost gospels, but upon scrutiny they they have been shown to be uh, just that you know fakes. So uh, yeah, Jesus uh, was was a member, was a religious former in the in the tradition of Mahavira or the Buddha, and put his life on the line to uh, to save uh, living creatures, other all the other living creatures, and was executed for trying to liberate animals from the temple, and uh, for interfering in the commerce of animals. Yes. I know it's interpretation or misinterpretation. People cite that he made all the fish so people could eat the fish. Yeah. That's like a linguistic misinterpretation? Yeah, yeah, it is exactly, yeah. I, in my book, Food for the Gods, I analyzed uh, the, I, I, I studied Greek in, the, in college and had a, so I was able to read the original text. The uh, the uh, in the Gospel of John, for example, the word for fish is uh, actually the, uh, it's not ichthua, which is little fish, uh, but it's opsaria. Opsaria. The word they use for fish is opsaria, which means uh, the first meaning of which is um, relish. Relish derives from the Homeric uh, opson, you know. So uh, it's what he was doing is, is uh, creating bread and, and relish, you know, rather than bread and fish. So it's been completely mis- mistranslated. And one finds that quite often, that food, uh, the words that are used for bread are translated as meat. Uh, by the, you know, the uh, in the in the Jacobean times, the uh, the King James version uh, of the Bible was translated. Of course, meat itself has shifted its uh, its meaning from from uh, Jacobean times, where it meant food. To uh, its more restricted meaning today, where it refers to uh, animal flesh, because uh, in the Jacobean times, the word meat referred it was derived from the Latin mandare, that which is to be eaten, uh, to uh, so it with the mandibles. So you know it was uh, had a different meaning entirely. You know it survives in the term sweet meat or nut meat, and it had no. Uh, Specific reference to animal flesh, so even that that term has shifted its meaning. But obsaria refers to relish primarily, and that's how people uh, ate in antiquity. They would take bread and they would dip it into this, uh, uh, you know, something like uh, tahini or uh, olive you know, olive paste, and uh, that would be the substance of a meal. Of course, the bread was very was very nourishing, uh, filled with enzymes and vitamins. Uh, phytonutrients, not like the the botched bread that they sell today. It was very. It was a, the staff of life. So what? He, so Jesus was probably you know providing a banquet of bread and and uh, opsaria. So that's a mistranslation. Yeah. Uh, I didn't recall uh, eat my flesh. Yeah, quite possibly. Yeah. Usually, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, he did recruit fishermen, and uh, of course, what did he do? He he 
lured them away from that uh, depraved profession and said, become uh, evangelists, follow me, give up your profession, become fishers of men, not, not uh, murderers of sea creatures, essentially. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, uh, it w- probably wasn't a Passover meal, but there are many. I have many Jewish friends who uh, who have vegan Passovers, so it's quite possible that it was. Then he belonged to an anti-sacrificial uh, vegan sect, which which didn't indulge in those uh, abominations. So we say, <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, the uh, the Essenes uh, are another. Or the Ebionites, the Nazoreans, they were all uh, anti sacrificial uh, sects in the, in the uh, mold of uh, the Buddhists and the Jains and the Pythagoreans. And in fact, Josephus, who lived for many years as, a, uh, as an Essene and writes about, about it extensively, uh, refers to them as Jewish Pythagoreans. Oh, yeah, right. Well, maybe that's why they lived into uh, triple digits, because they were vegans and raw foodists and all the, Methuselah and all the great uh, uh, fathers uh, were uh, long, very long-lived before they started eating, eating animals. That may account for it. And as I mentioned, the Gnostics uh, were... And, all Gnostic groups uh, were uh, were vegan. Certainly, the the priests, the perfecti, as they were called, lived on a diet uh, of food that was suffused with light, because they were trying to to uh, return to the pleroma, the source of light. So the last thing they would eat is uh, dead, uh, decaying uh, flesh, animal flesh. And uh, then the next group is the Cathars. Are you familiar with the Cathars? Sorry, so you're saying they were, they were eating light. Is it food that means- food uh, suffused with light, which, you know, uh, fruit, for example, you know, heliotropic food, not animal flesh. They discouraged eating animal flesh. And certainly the, the perfecti lived largely on fruit and uh, on fire fruits and vegetables. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. when you cook, you're sort of removing the life from food, and we're rediscovering that today. Where you know, raw foodism is becoming has become a uh, you know very much of a of a modern movement. You know, it's in New York we have about 18 raw food restaurants. So it's making a comeback. The Pythagorean athletes were raw foodists, and Diogenes Laertes describes his diet as being uh, Roma Apura. The, uh, so the Cathars were another, they were a medieval sect, and like the Gnostics, they were a heresy. They were considered a heresy. Uh, they, uh, the, again, the, they, they, like the other Gnostic groups, they the priests were uh, probably were raw, raw foodists, living on fruits and vegetables entirely, and encouraged their followers to be to be vegans. And this is a matter of record. You can pick up any book on the, the Cathars and find that this was the, the food they were eating. They posed a threat to the established church, uh, the Catholic Church, the Church of Rome because they were so successful in converting members of their community in the outlying areas in southern France, the Provençal area of southern France, to their lifestyle and to their religion, that uh, the church began to worry about losing so many of its members to, to these uh, Cathars. Cathars. The word Cathars is believed to derive from the, uh, the Greek word for purity, <coughs> 
catharine to purify, uh, catharsis, which is the removal of, of uh, emotion, the draining of emotion. So, uh, the catharsis, they were the pure ones, and they, their priests, like the no, other Gnostic priests of antiquity, uh, subsisted on a, essentially a raw vegan diet. Uh, and as I mentioned, they posed such a threat to the established church, the Church of Rome, that the, they ended up, the Pope ended up uh, launching a crusade against the Cathars. He threatened them, uh, he threatened them with uh, violence, with punishment, if they did not convert to Catholicism. Uh, and uh, the Cathars refused to, to uh, capitulate. As a result, the Pope, uh, good, uh, true to his word, uh, <clears throat> promised all the nobles in Europe uh, and rewarded them with a place in heaven, a prominent place in heaven, and rewarded them with uh, lands and uh, booty and all sorts of things. And so they ended up launching a crusade uh, of all the European uh, military aristocracies against the Cathars in southern France, and uh, eventually, uh, during what the this Albigensian Crusade, they call it, in the 13th century, they wiped out the, the Cathars. Uh, and the, the phrase that was used, <coughs> because the, the, uh, the armies uh, they descended on, the, on southern France, and um, there were, they, not, they noted that there were a number of Catholics uh, sprinkled among the Cathars, and... Uh, they were told to uh, exterminate them all, and God will sort out the Catholics from the heretics. <laughs> so uh, this is another. It was a very influential sect, despite its being uh, exterminated, because there were a few survivors who uh, migrated to other parts of Europe, uh, notably. Uh, Vinci in, in southern in Italy, uh, which was the home of uh, the great Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. I believe that he imbibed his veganism from uh, from the local Cathar refugees in uh, in Italy. Italy. Saint Francis also, uh, his father also uh, tr was a cloth merchant who traveled to. Uh, the Cathar regions of France and uh, imbibe some of their teachings. And so St. Francis is believed to have been influenced by the Cathars as well. So uh, even though they, they did die out as a religious group, uh, they, they continued to have a, an exert an influence uh, on European culture. The troubadours, for example, uh, were a Cathar Phenomenon, the Cathar. So, uh, the poetry, the Provencal poetry of that period is uh, drenched in Catharism. So, there's, that's another uh, vegetarian group that changed the world. <laughs> uh, the Bible Christians. Uh, does anyone know who they were? The Bible Christians? They were. Uh, a sect, uh, a European sect, uh, that, that derived from uh, the work of Emanuel Swedenborg, who taught that uh, uh, this depraved state of humanity has come about through the eating of animal flesh. And they, uh, they were started by, uh, this group was uh, by Reverend Cowherd in uh, Manchester, England. Or a place, a town near Manchester called Salford, and he, he established the Bible Christian Church uh, in 1807. And in uh, about 1817, they uh, Cow, uh, Cowherd believed that the North American colonies, former colonies, were in need of uh, missionary work because they were not obviously not vegetarians. They were eating the standard uh, British diet of uh, meat and two vegetables, <laughs> meat and two veg. So he sent uh, 
a, a uh, emissaries from uh, pilgrims, that is, from, from uh, Salford, Bible Christian, to, the, to uh, North America to try to convert the uh, uncivilized Americans to a, to a vegan, uh, to a vegetarian diet. So he uh, sent his, uh, his 12 minutes, okay. <laughs> Uh, he sent uh, his uh, uh, one of his emissary, William Metcalf, uh, to Philadelphia to establish the Bible Christian Church, the first uh, vegetarian uh, church in North America in 1817. And, yeah, in Philadelphia. Yeah, of course. Then, unfortunately, they they uh, went uh, defunct in the early 20th century, but they. They, they published a, a journal and, uh, which lasted into the 1920s. And uh, William Metcalf, the, uh, the founder of the, of the church in Philadelphia, was actually a, uh, a, became a vice president of the first uh, vegetarian society, uh, official vegetarian society in 1848. And, in uh, New York, New York City. Uh, Sylvester Graham was there, and Bronson Alcott, and all the great uh, vegetarian uh, figures of, the, of that period, many of whom had been influenced by, by Metcalf and his, his, uh, his church uh, homilies. Is that the first vegetarian society in the U.S. or in the world? No, in the U.S., yeah. In, uh, in New York City, they all met and, uh, uh, at Clinton Hall, and they elected uh, members from throughout, largely in the Northeast. I think uh, Sylvester Graham was, I think Metcalf was, actually was president. Yes? I have a couple of old members of the vegetarian board from the Netherlands. Is any organization there um, interested in? In the Netherlands? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the Netherlands, you're yes. saying? There were. Here. The, which group was this? The, the Dutch president. <clears throat> yeah, the Dutch president. I'm not. No, I'm not saying they were the first. I'm saying they were. Oh, they was the first in the U.S. The first official vegetarian society in the U.S. was, uh, and they elected members from the. Uh, prominent vegetarian figures of the period, Sylvester Graham, the food reformer, uh, who gave, uh, gave us Graham flour, and uh, Graham crackers uh, were named in his honor. Uh, <laughs> he didn't invent the Graham cracker, but uh, he was a very prom- he himself was a minister, uh, a food reformer, showing, showing again the, the connection between uh, religion and uh, diet, which is quite remarkable. Because all of these uh, organizations have a, have a religious component, strangely enough. So the Bible Christian was really the first organized vegetarian society uh, in the US, in America. You know, we, it was not a, a secular group. Uh, they st- started in 1817. The first secular group started uh, in the uh, in New York, Clinton Hall, and I think Metcalf, the the minister of the Bible Christian Church, was the president, and Sylvester Graham was the vice president, and uh, Bronson Alcott, and all of these uh, f- seminal figures were members of the of the first uh, secular vegetarian society. Some years later, um, and then SDA. What does that mean? SDA. That's right, Seventh Day Adventists. Uh, right, and they uh, they were probably the first uh, homegrown religious organization in the U.S. to uh, promote uh, a vegetarian diet. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that it was a female who, st- who really started the, the vegetarian, uh, launched the Seventh-day Adventists. And who was that? Yeah. Uh, they, were, she, they were one of two uh, founders of uh, 
religions in the 19th century who were female. White. That's right, Ellen White. Ellen White, the other, of course, was the, uh, the other founder. Yeah, Mary Baker Eddy, the Christian science. Uh, yeah, uh, five minutes, okay. So, yeah, we're at the, at the end here, which is appropriate. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists, they were, they belonged to, uh, they grew out of this, this apocalyptic sect called the Millerites. Uh, and Miller was uh, a, uh, <clears throat> he was a believer in the uh, second coming of Jesus. And uh, he actually set a date, he made the mistake of setting a date for the, uh, the imminent return of, of uh, Jesus and uh, the uh, rapture and all of this. And uh, the, uh, of course, they, they, I think he said that within this year, 1843, I think it was, uh, Jesus will return and take us all up to heaven. And, of course, the day, uh, as often happens, uh, the time came and went and uh, no, no, no appearance of Jesus. So, so his followers were were deeply disillusioned, but taking up the mantle of, uh, of, of Miller was uh, Ellen White. And uh, as in so many of these apocalyptic, characteristic of these apocalyptic sects is that uh, we will return to the original way of life, the original Garden of Eden and Jesus. And the, uh, that, of course, means... Uh, uh, Sylvester Graham had, had this in his teachings as well, that when you return to the original way of life, the Edenic lifestyle, what do you eat? You eat the, the, uh, right, the diet of uh, the first couple, as Sylvester Graham called them. First couple. Uh, even Adam, well, they were eating uh, a vegan diet, right? Before the fall. So, essentially a raw food vegan diet. Uh, as it's described in uh, Genesis. So uh, Ellen White, uh, called, uh, echoing Sylvester Graham, called for us to return to the uh, Edenic diet. Uh, because uh, they were, it was an apocalyptic, uh, they were and it remains an apocalyptic sect, preaching that Jesus will come again and restore us to our perfection. And we uh, enjoyed perfection during the, uh, the time of Genesis. When we were eating, we were not eating animals. We were eating essentially a raw food vegan diet. Not that she did. I mean, she was not a, and she was not 100% consistent. But the Seventh-day Adventists did have an enormous impact uh, on American dietary, world, I should say, uh, world dietary values. <clears throat> by virtue of having uh, produced uh, probably one of the greatest food inventors of all time. Who? Kellogg. Yeah. John Harvey, Dr. John Harvey Kellogg was a protege of Ellen White. And uh, he was a prodigious food inventor. He was raised by, uh, as an Adventist uh, and worked for the Whites in their... Uh, uh, on their newspaper, the uh, Review and Herald. And uh, he read a lot of the books in Ellen's library, uh, written by Sylvester Graham and uh, food reformers of the period. And uh, he, he, that's how he beca became a militant vegetarian. And uh, he went on to, to develop uh, uh, meat substitutes in the form of cornflakes. He, he, uh, he invented the... Flaking process for uh, you know this breakfast cereal, launching the first uh, internationally successful breakfast cereal, which was designed to be a substitute for bacon and eggs <laughs> at breakfast. <laughs> and then for lunch, he reformed the eating patterns of people at lunch by inventing peanut butter, which would, was to be a surrogate for uh, for uh, cold cut sandwiches. And then, uh, of course, he invented meat analogs, uh, meat made from wheat, some of the early soy products. Uh, so uh, 
the, the Seventh-day Adventists uh, have been instrumental in uh, converting uh, vegetarians and carnivores, th uh, carnivores into vegetarians throughout the, throughout the world because there are vegetarian uh, Seventh-day Adventist restaurants uh, in almost every country in the world. Even when I was in Czechoslovakia two years ago, in Prague they have a, a prominent vegetarian restaurant, which is a, an Adventist one. Okay. So uh, I've tried to demonstrate that uh, the, many of these groups that have been so successful in trying to return us to the original diet, be it that of uh, Genesis or, let's say, the Golden Age, which the Greeks and Romans look back to, uh, were, uh, were, had a religious component to them and uh, have been uh, enormously influential. Sure. Do any of you have any 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 questions? Further questions? I just wanted to say that Ellen G. White actually, they were all eating meat. She fell into a trance, came out and said, we've got to all become vegetarians. Yeah. So I, I just love saying that a channel of vegetarian is, is just something. Yeah, that's possible. <laughs> that's quite possible. They <laughs> have yeah, the right channel. Yeah. I was wondering, could this body be the second coming of Jesus or so? So Who was that? Um, yeah. Mayor Obama or something? The name disappeared in me. Oh, okay, well, that's quite likely. I think we're all, uh, we all have that potential to... Uh... <laughs> yes? Well, the Axial Age, they, 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 all of these uh, religious reformers, the original one sprang up during what Carl Jaspers calls the Axial Age. Is that what it was? Yeah, a hymns-based culture. A hymns-based culture derived from India. That seems to be this uh, ex oriente lux, you know, right. Driving through Loma Linda, the yeah. Avenue, yeah. I wanted to pick up a sandwich at the grocery store. Yes. Yeah. Ready to eat. They didn't have one red ready to eat vegan thing in the entire grocery oh, store. Wow. Everything was vegetarian. Oh, okay. Every fake meat sandwich had cheese or mayonnaise. Oh, that's a disgrace. I ended up eating yeah. a Del Taco. Oh, God. <laughs> wow. What a disgrace. Yeah. Well, at least uh, the, the original imp impetus <laughs> was pure, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you.